Hi everyone, welcome to Rescuing Watches. Today we have a special watch and one that you don't usually find many people wearing. This is a Vulcan Grand Prix, probably from the mid 50s. It's an automatic watch and as you can see it's in very rough shape. Vulcan is one of the old Swiss manufacturers. They had some issues in the 80s during the quartz crisis, as most of the watch brands did. They had to stop making watches for a while, but surprisingly, the brand restarted their production around 20 years ago and they are still around. This one seems to have been hit pretty hard. I'm slightly worried about that, not only because of the glass pieces on top of the dial, but because of the damage that we could find inside. The watch is not running, but let's see if we can at least wind it a bit. Um, we can't. The crown doesn't seem to move. It does not pop out and it doesn't spin either. And the corrector. No surprise, it doesn't work either. Well, not the best start, but what we will try to do today is to get this thing running again. So we will take this apart, find out what's broken, clean it, and hopefully someone can get to wear the watch again. Let's see what we have here. The movement doesn't look too bad, it needs a lot of cleaning. I can see a lot of dirt specks, but I don't see any rust, which is great news. You can see Vulcan Watch Co. written in the rotor. 17 joules, so that's the amount of synthetic rubies we have inside. Made in Switzerland and unadjusted. Now, to separate the movement from the case, we take the stem out first. And this is... This is weird. Something seems blocked and doesn't let me pull the stem off. This could be because there's rust in the killer's works that is blocking the stem, but my guess is that something is bent, so let's use the hand tool as a lever. Okay, good. That worked. Let's see if we can pull it out now. It still didn't work. It doesn't want to come out. And if I learned something during the time I've been fixing watches is to not force anything or we will break something else. Okay, that didn't work, so we have to go for the plan B, which is taking the movement ring from inside the case. So usually the same movement is used in different types of watches from potentially other brands. And a movement ring is made specifically for one case and it's used to fix the movement inside so it doesn't move around. Let's see, now with a bit more space we should be able to pull it out. And we can't. So yeah, let's continue this assembling from the inside of the watch. We have the rotor swinging all over the place so maybe if we remove the automatic winding parts that sit on top we can see a bit better what's happening. Now we go under the bridge carefully with the screwdriver and... Hmm, what? Oh. No surprise, it's not moving. I removed the wrong screws. Those ones are from the train of wheels bridge um, down below. So these three should be the ones. Okay, good. Now with that bridge off, we can already spot the second issue. If you have a look at the center jewel, you will see that it's broken. There are pieces of ruby everywhere, probably because of the heat, and I bet it's not the last broken part we find. Okay, I hope this works. I will try to go underneath the movement, lift it a bit, and try to pull the stem at the same time. Oof, okay, we got it out. A bit of a rough start, but in the end we managed. Now something important when taking an unrunning watch like this apart is to inspect every single thing we remove. Vintage watches, especially when they are this old, are very delicate, and when the crystal is broken like that is usually bad news. It seemed to me that the second hand was moving, but not anymore. Let's take all this glass away carefully. And have a look at these two marks, because this is one of the reasons I like this watch so much. These are imprints that the hands left on the dial when the movement stopped, and this is super nice. Usually when you buy vintage watches, you don't get any information about the watch, but in this one you can actually see the exact time when the watch stopped at 11.42. Next item in our list of broken parts and definitely one of the reasons the watch stopped. The second hand is bent and as you can see it gets caught underneath the minute hand. The hands look terrible by the way so let's take them away and we will have a look at them later. You can see the Vulcan logo there. The brand has a long history, it was founded in 1858 and underneath that is written Grand Prix which is the model of the watch. I have to admit, I did a lot of research and I had a hard time finding any information about this specific model. What I did find though were these strange symbols on old adverts of Vulcan Grand Prix watches. It took me a while to understand what it's written underneath, but it says Chaudofon 1881, Paris 1889, 
Chicago 1893 and Geneva 1896. So I didn't know what any of those dates or cities meant, but after digging a bit, I found that all those places are referencing world expositions, which were very popular events that were held for months at a time in different cities around the world, and different countries were invited to showcase their products, their achievements, and their culture to millions of visitors. And you know what this means in case of Switzerland, advancements in watchmaking was a big part of what they presented. In these exhibitions, there were also prizes being given, so these round symbols you saw are medals won by Vulcan for the quality of their watches. We always try to keep the dial protected while we're restoring the watch, so let's put it in this box. And the disassembling starts by putting the balance away so we don't damage it. Specifically, we can't damage the balance spring, which is this very thin spring that you will see now. If that gets bent, it's a very, very delicate process to put it back in shape. I've only done it a couple times, but it really took me a long time under the microscope to fix that. We can see this bridge, which is a train of wheels bridge. It has a little spring that holds down a wheel, but I'm not sure what that wheel is for yet. And the barrel bridge over here. Let's have a quick look at the center jewel under the microscope. And yeah, that will need to be replaced. These are synthetic rubies, so very hard stones, but they can be brittle as well. We're going to disassemble this watch a bit differently. This is the first time I work on this movement. I started with a hobby around three years ago, so every time I work on a new watch, it usually has parts I've never seen before, which doesn't make it easier. I will disassemble all the modules together, and then we will take them apart one by one so we can get an idea of how this works. Now we take off the ratchet wheel, which is screwed onto the barrel arbor, and then we can take off the whole barrel bridge. We can see the barrel here with the lid slightly open, so that's potentially another reason why this watch doesn't work. Second wheel off, and third wheel off. This movement has a small bridge that secures the center wheel. We take it off. And the last thing to remove here is a pallet cock. It's called the cock when it has only one screw, and it's called the bridge when it has two or more screws on opposite sides. We have to be careful here, the pallet fork pivots are very delicate and we don't want to break them. Okay. And this is the pallet fork. I was having a look at the wheels under the microscope and this is what I found. This is the second wheel pivot and you can see it's slightly bent at the tip. This will tilt the hands and also make the watch stop, so we have to straighten this back and the best way to do this is with the tweezers. First thing we do is to use a marker and make a little sign to show the direction where the pivot is bent, just like that. And with the back of the tweezers we press very carefully in the opposite direction. And there you go. Seems straight to me. If you do this using the tip of the tweezers instead, you risk snapping the pivot completely. If you're starting with a hobby, I highly recommend you to get a cheap microscope because there's no chance I would have spotted this by eye, and this is the case with a lot of the parts. They're too small to see these kind of things without magnification. Time to start with the dial side, and the calendar is the first thing to remove. This is a plate that holds a calendar wheel in place, but it's not directly screwed to it since the calendar has to spin once a day. And the calendar wheel, very carefully, because it has paint on it. I'm not quite sure what this is. I was expecting to see more wheels underneath, but instead there seems to be this big module with a couple of springs attached to it. This thin one here is the one that locks the calendar in place. Okay. And this one behind looks like... Hmm, that must be the mechanism that gets activated when you push the corrector on the case. We'll set this apart and have a look at it later. Now these are the wheels I was looking for. This is the date indicator driving wheel and an intermediate wheel that make the calendar spin. There's a small cover plate for the setting wheel, the setting wheel itself, and minute wheel. And the last part of the motion works, the cannon pinion in the middle is pressure fitted, so we need a tool for this. And where did it go? Oh, here. 
It's a relief to not find any rust in here. In these older watches, the crown is the weak point and where moisture gets in. So when the keyless works is clean, it means that the watch was well sealed all these years. Let's remove the yoke spring, the yoke, and this is it for this side. The center wheel is attached to the cannon pinion from the other side, so it just fell off when we removed it. This is an AS Shield 1476 movement. AS Shield was one of the biggest um, movement manufacturers by the 1920s in Switzerland, but the company ended up merging with ETA during the 70s, which is now the largest movement manufacturer to survive the quartz crisis. So the company is no longer in business, but these movements are still known for being very reliable, and there's even a couple of watch manufacturers that still use them for new watches. Now this is the calendar module that we removed before with this little hammer looking part and this is what happens when you push the corrector button on the case so this part goes in and then it has a spring that moves it out again. I'm thinking that this must be a quick set for the date. And this spring seems to be attached on the other side of the module. I think I will just pull it. Okay, good. In this watch you saw at the beginning, the crown is quite thin, so this case acts as a crown guard, and it's not so easy to wind it up or adjust the time, which is probably the reason why they implemented the button to automatically change it. So we finish here with a train of wheels bridge, and it has this extra wheel that I'm still wondering what it is for, but it must be part of the automatic winding. The last one is the barrel bridge, this sits on top of the barrel and holds it in place. And on top of it, we still have the click and the click spring that we will take out using some Rodica so it doesn't fly away. Let's have a closer look at the stem because I'm still not sure why it was so difficult to get out. It can be that the movement was not sitting straight inside the case or that the stem was bent. And it seems to be the second one. I know it doesn't look like much, but it's definitely enough to get stuck. Now onto the barrel. Usually to open it, we would need to press it down, but the lid was not closed properly, so it should come off easily. We take the barrel arbor first, and now we remove the mainspring. As you know, mechanical watches don't have a battery to keep the whole thing running, so the power comes from this coiled mainspring instead. Mechanical watches can be manual or automatic, and these days most of them are automatic, and to make this work, the Swiss invented a very clever trick that uses the energy of your wrist as the battery that powers the watch. The rotor, which is that big part that we removed from the top of the movement, spins back and forth when you're wearing the watch. Underneath the rotor, there is a wheel attached, and that wheel spins together with it, so that motion is sent through a train of gears to the barrel arbor, which also spins and coils the mainspring. The mainspring is in good shape, so we will keep this one, and now let's have a look at the case. The crystal is pressure fitted, so to remove it we just have to press it out like that. Oh god. Well, at least it came out in one piece. In these old watches that have not been worn in many years, the dirt accumulates in the least exposed places, which is usually between the logs, and with time it dries up and it gets stuck there. I've tried putting these dirty cases before in the ultrasonic bath, but it never cleans it completely, especially when there is so much dirt, so we have to use a pegwood stick to avoid scratches, and we go through all the gaps of the case. That means in between the logs, in the space where the crystal sits, in the space where the case back screws, and also the pendant tube where the crown sits. All of this came out only from the case. Okay, let me clean this a bit. I just realized we didn't disassemble the automatic winding parts. This is what I was talking about. So this set of parts is the mechanism that allows the watch to wind automatically. The rotor is basically an oscillating weight with the weight distributed towards the outer part so that it spins around its axis easily. And this mechanism was invented by Breguet, which is a brand that you might recognize a long time ago, around the 1700s. Breguet was one of the pioneers of watchmaking, so you will find a lot of parts named after him. There is a small spring underneath this cover plate that I'm not sure what it does yet, but let's take it apart.
Before the cleaning, I'm going to lay out all the parts next to each other. Usually you get a sense for which part goes where when you do this for a while, but with new movements, there's always a risk to misplace a screw and then spend hours trying to figure out why the watch doesn't work properly. As you might remember, we have a broken center jewel to replace. And what we have here is called the donor movement. So another AI Shield 1476 that I got off eBay, and we're going to check if we can swap the broken jewel. Generally, when you find a broken part, there are three options. If you're a skilled watchmaker and have the tools, you can make a new part yourself, but that takes a lot of skill and training and effort. So if the part you're looking for is available online, the much easier route is sourcing and replacing that specific part or what we did in this case, finding a donor movement. The one you choose depends a bit on the watch you're working with. Sometimes it's too expensive to buy a whole movement, but if that's not the case, I usually prefer it since, as you can see, these vintage watches often have several parts broken. Let's have a look at the jewels under the microscope. They are very dirty, but not broken. The best way to check this is to shine light from underneath, so it looks like an X-ray, and we can see if there are any cracks. Okay, so since all of them look good, instead of replacing that specific jewel into our bridge, we will try replacing the whole bridge into our movement. And by the way, if you're wondering why I didn't take the second wheel as well, look at this. Even worse than ours. Let's start with the cleaning. The larger parts go in the ultrasonic cleaner with a special watch cleaning solution. And as you already know, the smaller parts go inside the watch cleaning machine. By the way, if you are interested in more watch related content or project updates in between videos, make sure you follow Rescuing Watches on Instagram. Let's go ahead and start with the reassembly. As usual, the first step is installing the mainspring and we need to lubricate it first. I didn't see any issues with it, sometimes they're bent or kinked or they are just too old and lost to be their shape, but this one looks good and if we can keep original parts we will always try to do that. This mainspring has an S shape and at the end of it there's a small portion that it sticks out, you can see it right there. This is called the sleeping bridle and you find this only in automatic watches. And the reason is that with these watches the oscillating weight keeps spinning and spinning so the mainspring keeps coiling and coiling and if it gets too tight it will break. What this sleeping bridle does is to allow the mainspring to keep spinning inside the barrel when it's fully wound. So that way it doesn't get too tight and it doesn't break. Now the next step is to wind up the mainspring and install it again. And for that we have to find the adapter that is just small enough to fit inside the barrel. This one seems to work. So we fit the mainspring into the arbor which has a little pin that catches it and we slowly coil it. This tool is one of the most expensive ones, so it's quite a big investment. In general, watchmaking tools are not so cheap either, but there's three or four that are, I would say, really expensive. So if you're starting, you can always buy new mainsprings, which are around $10 each, at least the generic ones, while you decide if you like the hobby and you're willing to invest in one of these or not. But just so you know, if you buy one of these, it will certainly outlive you. And this is it, this is a mainspring fully coiled inside the tool and ready to be refitted into the barrel. Perfect. On the side of the mainspring's inner coil, you can see a hole. This is where the hook of the barrel arbor goes in, so we always make sure that it engages. Otherwise the arbor will turn, but if it doesn't catch the mainspring, the watch won't wind up. Now we just have to make sure that this time is correctly closed, and for that we use this small tool that helps pressing the barrel lid firmly inside the barrel. Now we can start placing back the wheels, starting with the center wheel, scape wheel, and the cover plate to fix the center wheel in place. This is a relatively complex movement, at least for my watchmaking skills. There are a lot of extra parts if you add a date complication and also a date corrector to the watch, but you can really tell why these movements were so highly valued and I'm not surprised Vulcan got so many awards in the international fairs.
There are other brands that got these medals, like um, Omega, Zenith, Longines, that even engraved them in the back of their watches, usually pocket watches, since the wrist watches started to become popular between the 1920s and 30s. Now that the wheels are in place, we can put the bridge on top. It always takes a bit of time because we have to match the three pivots inside their jewels. So before pressing down on the bridge, all the pivots must be in place. They're about 0.15 millimeters in diameter, so that means that if one of them is a bit tilted, it will bend or worse, it will break. The fair in Paris in the 1900s is the one that I found referenced the most in case bags, and these are some of the posters of the ones where Vulcan got medals in. This is the Paris 1889 fair, and this other one is the one in Chicago in 1893. These expositions were massive events. I read that one in every four Americans went to the one in Chicago, and they showed all kinds of things. For instance, in that one, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla had the space to show their inventions. So the thing is that a lot of influential people and influential brands at the time were at these fairs, and watch manufacturers were very proud being awarded for the quality of their watches, which is the reason Vulcan released this Grand Prix model, to commemorate this and to show the public that they are a high-quality brand. This part is a bit delicate, we have to reinstall the click spring, so we hold it down while we put it in place so it doesn't jump. And then we have to bend this side of the spring to make space and fit the click. The click has a little pin underneath that engages with that spring. We just have to screw it down before releasing it. And what it does is moving the click back in position to block the ratchet wheel when winding the watch. Some oil for the barrel arbor and the crown wheel post. And then the ratchet wheel goes in. This wheel has a square hole in the middle that fits inside the square portion of the barrel arbor, so we have to align them well. And also the click. And we block the wheel with this plastic tool so it stops spinning and we can screw it tight. I had to do a bit of research into this movement to make sure I know how all the parts work and we assemble them properly, and it turns out that this is a driving wheel for the crown wheel, which is part of the automatic mechanism, and the spring that holds it down is called a breguet spring. Now the crown wheel goes in, and the crown wheel screw, which is the only screw in the movement that screws to the left. Good, this was Achilles works from the side of the movement, now we continue with the rest of it in the dial side, and we will be able to see if the watch winds up correctly. The first step is to put some oil in both the sliding pinion and the winding pinion. And before we can continue, we have to put the stem inside the movement. Since the original one was bent, we got a new one. This one, as you can see, is way longer than what we need. But since this movement is used in other watches, which have many different types of cases, they usually sell them longer so you can cut it at the length you need. We apply some oil in all the sections that will be in contact with other parts, and as you can see there is a square portion in the stem, and this is the reason why the stem makes a sliding pinion spin, that square portion fits inside the square hole of the pinion, so every time the crown turns, the pinion turns as well. The Keyless Works was one of the big inventions that turned watchmaking upside down. This was in the 1840s, so before that, if you were the owner of a pocket watch, you had to carry a separate key to wind it. And from then, all pocket watches introduced a big crown on top, and that carried out onto wrist watches. To finish with the Achilles works, we have to place the yoke inside its post, and make sure that the tip sits in the middle of the sliding pinion. We are applying a tiny bit of this blue oil to all the parts that will have a certain amount of friction to reduce the wear, since they are constantly rubbing against each other. We carefully install the yoke spring, always holding it down, setting wheel and setting lever spring. This part here has a two-in-one function. One of them is to act as a cover plate for the yoke, and the other is to control the movement of the setting lever with this thinner part that we just placed now. And it allows the setting lever to move between two positions when the crown is pulled and pushed. Now at this point we can already check if the watch works, and if it does work, we can also check if it keeps time accurately or not. Worst case scenario, if it doesn't work at all, we will have to do some troubleshooting. But first, to check if we can bring it back to life, we install the pallet fork and the pallet cock. 
So that stops the train of wheels from spinning and we can wind the mainspring. Before installing the balance, we have to clean it properly. And even though we run it through the watch cleaning machine, there can still be some oil residues. So we use a solvent specially made for hair springs called B-Dip. We place the whole balance inside and with a bit of agitation, all the remaining residues dissolve quite quickly. Very important, never use water to clean a watch. We always use solvents to clean watch parts because they evaporate very easily and they don't leave any moisture inside. Okay, now let's see if we did a good job or not. The balance wheel also has two pivots and they have to be inside the respective jewels for it to spin. And it works! Oh, it stopped. Let me check. Okay, good. This golden spring that you see on top of the balance holding the jewel is called the Inca block system and is essentially a shock absorber. This was invented in the early 30s and it was a big deal since before then, dropping a watch would most likely mean breaking the balance pivots. The way this works is with two separate jewels, the balance stop jewel which is embedded into a metal setting and the capstone that sits on top. After cleaning them, we lubricate them with a bit of oil in the capstone and then we place the other jewel on top and both of them go inside the setting and the spring is secured on top. One side first and then the other one. We do the same for the lower jewel and what this mechanism is here for is to allow for the balance staff pivots to have a bit of room to move around. Now imagine that you drop the watch by accident if the pivots were fixed in position, they would immediately snap and the balance staff would need to be replaced. So having some extra space allows the pivots to bounce a bit in between the jewels and stay in one piece. Now that we see the balance spinning, we know that the watch works, but not if it keeps time accurately. To check that, we use a machine called Time Grapher. And the answer is pretty good. This looks a bit complicated, but there are three basic parameters to look at. The first one is rate, and what this tells you is how much time the watch is gaining or losing per day. In our case, we have two seconds, zero seconds, so very good. Then what the amplitude means is how many degrees the balance wheel is rotating. In this case, it's quite acceptable. Generally, the higher, the better. And then the bit error, which could be better. You would want to see that lower than one degree. This tells you the difference between the clockwise and the counterclockwise turns of the balance. But bit error does not have an impact in timekeeping, and the truth is that in these old watches it's quite risky to attempt to correct that. I would have to disassemble the balance completely, and that means risk damaging the hairspring, so I'm happy as it is. Oh, worse than I thought. We already had a quick look at the hands at the beginning, and they don't look very good, to be honest. I can see a layer of grime on top, and there are rests of... I think rust. The loom is also gone and this one is radium based, so it's radioactive. We need to be very careful with that, especially since we have to remove it from the hands. But first things first, if you remember, this hand was spent and was getting caught under the minted hands, so we have to straighten this very, very carefully. A bit more. Okay, good. Still in one piece. We have a couple of options if we want to remove the loom safely. My preferred one is to submerge the hands in isopropyl alcohol so there's no particles floating around and we don't inhale them. Another option is to secure the loom with nail polish first, so when you remove it, it falls off in chunks rather than in small particles. The first thing to do is to scrape the old one off, so we use a sharp scalpel for that and you can see the loom coming off there. We only do this in the hour and minute hands since those are the only ones that have loom. Usually the hands in vintage watches are made either of polished steel or brass, and if they are made out of brass, are rhodium plated or gilded, so gold plated. There are exceptions to that, but in our case, I think that what we saw under the microscope was not the brass underneath the plating, but instead this brown residue looks like rust coming out of the hands.
For the next step, we need to have the hands on a flat surface because we will be applying some pressure to clean them well and we don't want to bend them. What we do is to use pithwood as a support. Pithwood comes in these small chunks and it's used in watchmaking because it's very, very soft. The advantage of that is that you can sink the delicate parts of the watch in it, in this case the hands, so when we go back and forth over the surface trying to clean them, we make sure we don't bend them. We start with some pegwood to remove the stubborn dirt or rust from the top. Okay, that looks fine. And then we continue with a microfiber swab. We dip it in isopropanol. Look at the dirt coming off. So we go very carefully back and forth over the whole surface of the hands. Now for the last step, we use a leather stick to polish very, very slightly the hands. It can sound a bit confusing, but the goal when restoring hands in these kinds of watches is not leaving the hands looking like new. If we would play them over, we would have a vintage looking dial, a vintage looking case with the usual scratches in it from all these years, and some shiny new hands on top. So the first thing that would catch the eye would be the hands, because the contrast between them and the rest of the watch would make them look out of place. What we want instead is to direct all the attention towards the dial and towards the case, so we have to restore the hands in a way that they end up looking like a well-preserved 70-year-old pair of hands. And this is how they look now, much, much better without all the rust, but still matching the character of the watch. Now that the radium loom is gone, the minute and the hour hands have a hole in the middle, which means we have to replace the loom. This is a more modern and safe solution called Super Luminova, which is what all the modern watches use. So this is basically a luminous powder that mixes with a varnish, so we put a bit of each, usually one to one, and mix them together until we have the right consistency. I haven't done this too many times, so I'm still figuring out what the right consistency is, but we can always add more powder or more liquid from the other vial, which is a thinner, if we need to make it thicker or more liquid. And I think it looks good. When you buy new loom, you can get it in many different colors. The one we're using here is white, which will have too much contrast with the cream dial and again, look weird. So we have to use a trick to make it darker and the trick is to use coffee. I've seen people doing all sorts of things, putting the hands in the oven, dipping them in tea, but since I only have this pair of hands, I'd rather not risk it. With this, what we want is the same thing. We want to match the color of the dial, so the whole thing looks as natural as possible. I think it needs a bit more binder and keep mixing until we don't have any clumps. Good, now to apply the loom, we have to stabilize the hands first. The pointy tool is usually used to fix the balance cock when, for example, you have to repair the hairspring. It's also very useful to fix the hands though, since it has a conical shape that can hold both of them at the same time. We take a bit of luminous paint and now slowly we go underneath the hands and apply it. We do this from underneath so that the paint doesn't go over the top of the hands and this is why having the correct texture is so important. You see that the surface tension of the paint is what is keeping it in place inside the holes. If the paste we made is too liquid, that will not work, and if it's too thick, we will leave a drop underneath. One more. Perfect! Now we have to leave them to dry. In the meantime, let's continue here. We still have quite a lot to assemble, so we continue with the motion works, which is the mechanism that allows us to set the time. The setting wheel fell, so we put it back in, and we lubricate the pin for the minute wheel and cannon pinion shaft. To put the cannon pinion back in place, we don't need any tool. We can just use a thicker pair of tweezers, and there you go. The minute wheel goes in, and we make sure that the teeth engage with the setting wheel and the cannon pinion.
The minion wheel has this tiny cover plate on top so it doesn't fall off. The hour wheel goes in. And this one, you can see it has another wheel integrated in it. This is here to drive the date indicator wheels, which are these two on top. Now at this point is where we disassemble the calendar module, so that's the next thing we have to install. And you can see a couple of holes carved in it, which leaves space for the hour wheel and date driver wheels. This module had a date corrector that gets activated with the button outside of the case, and I'm not quite sure how to put this together, but let's give it a try. It's a spring-driven part because it has to go back to position after being pushed, so let's first screw this on top, and then we see how we fit the spring afterwards. We can't screw it too tight since it must be able to move back and forth. Okay, good, so now we have to turn it, and then I think the spring was inside a little slot, and also screwed down. But... The tip of the spring should sit on top of the corrector post and not behind it. Hmm. So I think I will take this off again and I will try to insert it sideways and force it back into place. So first I need to align both holes so that we are able to screw it in. And then with this flat tool, I will try to hold it in place while I screw it in, and with a bit of luck, it won't fly away. Great, that went well. Now we place this on top, carefully, and screw it tight. What you didn't see is that the date wheel also has some teeth underneath, and these are made so that the parts that are sitting below are able to turn it and fix it in place. This long spring here is the one that fixes it in place, and we have to be very careful with these thin parts because they can bend very easily. To set the date wheel, we put it aside first. We place the calendar wheel on top. Okay, perfect. Now we release it and hope nothing flies away. Okay. Now we can fix everything in place with this cover plate. This is called the calendar guard, and after this, we will have all the parts that make the calendar mechanism work. And we can check already if the wheel spins or not. So theoretically, when the hour wheel hand makes two full turns, the calendar wheel should move. Perfect. Now all this set of parts go on top of the train of wheels bridge and what they do is transfer the energy from the oscillating weight to the mainspring. But there's a bit more to it and it starts with this little spring called the stop click. If you think about it, when these wheels spin and coil the mainspring, there must be something that stops the mainspring from uncoiling and that's exactly what this spring is for. We fix the cover plate on top. And now to continue with the rest, we have to assemble it directly on top of the movement. These are the reversing wheels, which allow the movement to wind when the rotor is moving clockwise or counterclockwise. And those are the two reduction wheels that connect the whole thing with the crown wheel. We just have to lay the bridge down carefully and fit the pivots inside the jewels. This part is exactly the same as with the train of wheels bridge below. Now that it's assembled, I can show you everything under the microscope so we get an idea about how all these parts are working together. This is the cannon pinion and it's where the wheel attached to the rotor goes. That wheel makes the reversing wheel spin in both directions. You can see there's two so it makes it easier to spin clockwise and counterclockwise. Then the stop click, you can see it here, fits inside the teeth of one of the wheels and blocks it so that the mainspring doesn't uncoil. If we move upwards, we find the second reduction wheel. You can see it's pivot here, which is connected to the driving wheel for the crown wheel that is held down by this um, breguet spring on the left. The crown wheel is here on the right, and I just spotted a tiny hair on top of it. Okay, good.
Time to fit the new crystal in. We took the dimensions from the broken one. Fortunately, it was only broken in the middle, so we could still measure it. And this rover press is the tool that we used to fit it inside the case. This is a generic glass. You could also buy original ones, but they are quite expensive and you only find them for specific watches. As you can see, it's pretty straightforward. The crystal goes in. We lower the press and make sure it's in the middle. Now we lower the press a bit more, we squeeze the glass and then we slide the case upwards until it fits. Releasing the press makes the glass expand inside the case and because of that pressure against the sides, it stays fixed in place. You need a new tool for it, but it's one of the easier repairs and fitting a new crystal always makes such a huge difference. Now very carefully, the dial goes in. There are two pins underneath called dial feet. Those are made out of brass or copper, so softer metals and very easy to break. And we kind of need them in one piece if we want to have the dial straight. Okay, I'm pressing downwards very carefully, but I don't think the pins are going in. And the reason is probably that the screws got tighter during the cleaning. So we have to take the movement out of the support and have a look at them. On the side of the watch, we find the dial fit screws. This is one of the most common things I've found to be broken in vintage watches that have not been treated very well by the previous owners and to repair them, as it's always the case in watchmaking, you have to buy another tool. And I think we have it. Let's put the hands on and see how they look. We always start with the hour hand carefully in the middle we want to make sure that it's inside, but not that it's too close to the dial. Now the minute hand goes on top. And look at that, we nailed it. The loom has the exact same creamy color as the dial behind it. We check that the calendar spins at midnight and it does. Now the seconds hand on and it should move as soon as it's inside the pivot. And there you go. Great. There is very little room between the hands, so let's make sure they don't touch each other and no problem there. This is looking very good. We just have to unscrew the setting lever to take the stem out. We don't unscrew completely, just enough to get the stem loose. And we gently clean the dial using the air blower. Perfect. We put the case on top, a bit tilted because we have the corrector button and then we flip it. We still have this very long stem that we used as replacement for the old one and it's way too long for this watch. So we remove the crown first and then we have to cut it at the exact length we need. We have to be careful here. We don't want to make a mistake now that we are so close to finish. It's always better to cut too little than too much. Otherwise it won't engage with Achilles works and we'll have to order a new one and wait another three or four days to continue. So let's say around here should be okay and we cut with the pliers. We probably didn't cut this straight, so let's even it out with a bit of sandpaper. Now we can check if the length is correct. If it's not, I will keep using the sandpaper just in case. And excellent, seems to fit well. Now let's fix it in place. And check if it works. Perfect. And don't forget the oscillating weight is the last part to go in. This is usually the reason why automatic watches tend to be a bit thicker than manual winding ones because of these extra parts that sit on top of the train of wheels bridge, but it doesn't make a big difference. We lock it in place and check that it spins freely and the gears underneath spin with it. Perfect, so we're finishing up here, new rubber gasket for the case so we get a good seal. This one had one of these old lead seals that are also toxic so we can replace it for a more modern rubber one and screw the case back. You can find round or flat rubber gaskets, this one had a flat one so it's always recommended to replace it with the same type. Round gaskets tend to be thicker and if you change it for the wrong one, the case bag will not sit properly in place and you won't have a good seal.
and it looks beautiful. Last step, let's put some nice drops on. I chose these ones here because they have a nice suede finish with a similar color as the two imprints that the hands left on top of the dial. And look how this thing looks now. I'm very happy with how this restoration turned out. It's a lesser known Vulcan model and not a very expensive watch by any means, but one that commemorates an era full of innovations in watchmaking and it's ready to be worn again. Oh, and before we forget, let's check if that corrector works. And there you have it. We're done. Check out the video description, I will put some links about all the expositions I mentioned before in case you're interested. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and see you on the next one.